Okay, welcome everybody to this uh, edition of Breaking Absolutes. Uh, I'm I'm really excited today to be able to talk with uh, Troy Donnelly. Uh, as always, my caveat that um, I may mess up a name, and I'll trust Troy to keep me honest on pronunciations, um, particularly because some of the instruments we're going to talk about today um, are, you know, they're not just guitars and basses, um, but it's actually what's ex part of what's exciting in talking to Troy. Um, many of you that follow the show uh, are going to know that that Troy plays with Nightwish and has now for several records. Um, part of what we do, of course, is go deeper on the artist and all of the things that they do, um, and all, not always just the the musical stuff. And Troy's got an absolutely um, like amazing list of creden credits as a contributing artist, as a producer. Um, He's done uh, some solo work that's classical in nature that's just beautiful. This was work I wasn't familiar with, so I, I took time to um, listen to a bunch of this, and I'm going to commend you to it as we, as we have our conversation. Uh, he has extensive uh, work in Celtic music, folk music, um, blends of that with rock, um, and we'll talk about some of the bands that he's, he's founded and uh, collaborated in there. Um, he has played, and, and we can't name them all just for want of time, but, um, and, we'll, and we'll get a little bit deeper on a few of them, but he's played with um, uh, guys like Steve Hackett from Genesis, Hans Zimmer, and these are all, at least all come as a consequence of um, Troy's expertise in, with particular um, um, instruments. Uh, and I want to talk to him about some of the sounds that these instruments um, um, have and, and what I think they convey emotionally. Um, Last couple of sparklers here, the, the last few records that he's been a very meaningful part of with, with Nightwish have had all kinds of chart positions. Um, they've hit number one, they've gone gold, they've gone platinum. Um, and that, that's in no small uh, part to his contribution, I think. Um, what he brings to the sound, I think, um, takes it to a place that it didn't have before. It's a, there's a fingerprint there that... Um, is, is lovely and evocative in ways that uh, music without it doesn't have, which isn't to say it's lesser than, it's just that uh, it's, it's a beauty that I've, I've kind of fallen in love with as I've spent a bunch of time with Troy's work. Um, so with that as my setup, let me bring the man on himself. Troy, welcome. Hiya, Peter, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you doing? Splendid, that was a, a, a lovely introduction. I, I, I don't know whether I can live up to that. Oh, you can. Yeah, I can't even. I can't even get to the half of it. Um, oh. had such a, an illustrious career. Um, I'm going to make one frivolous comment up front. Um, you're actually a more attractive, older man. Like you have aged so gracefully. Uh, it, <laughs> yeah. it, 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 it infuriates not, not, me a little. <laughs> yeah, not not. <laughs> oh, you're very kind. You're very kind. <laughs> By the way, you 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 did uh, pronounce my name superbly well. It is oh, Donockley. A lot of people say Don Ockley, or I've even had Don Cockley. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. better still, are you ready for this? Yeah, I had Mister Troy Dongleberry. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, I, I beats me. I've no yeah. idea. Yeah. But yeah, Donockley, Donockley. So you got it in one. Oh, well, got it in one. That's good. Yeah, well, I'll be, uh, my cheat there is that I did watch some interviews. Um, and so, you know, I, I was able to hear it a few times. So I can't take all the credit for, you know, having that natively in me. Um, <laughs> before we get into some of the, the actual music stuff, I would just, I wanted to talk a little bit about your early life. Um, and I guess this does have musical references in it, but your, your parents were musicians and, and they had an actual group that you ended up traveling with, yeah? Yeah, they were they were semi professional. They had a they had a, a country and western band up in the north of England, up in um, in Cumbria, and they were playing Johnny Cash and Hank Williams, but also relatively obscure country rock music as well. My dad had a really across the board um, taste in music, from country to classical to to uh, progressive rock to all kinds of things. So I had a really um, interesting musical upbringing. Uh, but yeah, I, I did actually end up playing in my mum and dad's band uh, when I was 15, 16, doing the, uh, the working men's clubs of the North, which was a baptism of fire, <laughs> <laughs> to, to say the least. 
to say the least, I mean, I could write a book on some of the things I, I saw. I, su I suppose it was doing the work of men's clubs up there. It was, it was like doing a, a tour detail in Afghanistan during the war, I think, probably. It was that kind of intensity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the, the first thing that kind of leaps out at me, and I don't know why it should, but um, it was mildly surprising to hear that country Western music was something that was not sort of just only interesting to you know americans in the in the south <laughs> yeah that's that's in, it's interesting isn't it because um the country country and western as it was known uh, was really big in the north of england and ireland ireland and the ireland had show bands and uh, the north of england had um uh, country and western bands and especially the west coast of of the north up there we had we had a lot of that but uh, yeah, that's that's where uh, my origins as a musician came from. But it was it goes deeper than that, as, as I'm sure, sure. You're, you're aware. It's um, it was it was though a, a lot down to my my amazing dad um, spotting the facility in me from an early age. He he, he saw that early, so um, I was really lucky. So to have the um, so talking about that, you you have this. Um, this facility with a, a, this beautiful menagerie of sort of, I don't know if medieval is the right term, but of, of instruments certainly that are more traditional, not typically associated with um, the music that you, I think you're most known for now. It, was that something that you learned f through your dad? Was it a, a, just an interest you had and you had to find people? Were you self-taught? I mean, the, 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 um, am I saying Illin pipes? Is that correct? Yeah, you've got it again, Ilan. Very good. You've done your homework. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it was. It was. It was. It, it's. It's. It's interesting again because my dad always wanted me to be a guitarist. Really, once he realised that that I was on the path, and that uh, nothing was going to shake me from my um, my resolve to be a musician, he wanted me to be a a guitar player. He, he, he thought that that was going to be my forte. But from an early age, from tw I started playing guitar when I was about 12, but I fell in love with the sound of the Ellen Pipes at around the same time. Um, they were they were a really obscure instrument at the time as well. They, they weren't, uh, they hadn't made it into the mainstream. Uh, not that they've ever been mainstream, I mean, let's <laughs> face it, but they'd never made it into into cinema. They'd never made it onto the soundtracks of of the likes of Titanic and uh, Braveheart at the time. They were they were uncommon. Uh, so it was a, it was quite a, a nightmare to to start learning the instrument. I mean, I've jumped I've jumped a bit there, but um, when I when I first heard them, I realised that it was an expression that I really needed. It sounded to me like part of my voice. Yeah, uh, a voice that I really needed to use. So when I when I turned up at my with to my dad saying, "Can you can you lend me some money to get a set of pipes?" He was like, "What? <laughs> what on earth do you want to play those for? I mean, you, you, what are you going to do with those?" I was going, "I've just got to do it." So he lent me he lent me three hundred quid at the time to get this half set that were in in, in some tiny little village in Cumbria, the second hand that I found, and uh, I had no idea how to how to even approach them. I hadn't, I hadn't really seen them before. They were that obscure. But my dad lent me the money and uh, and I never paid him back. <laughs> 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 which, he, which he does occasionally remind me of. But, uh. <laughs> oh, that's good. You should never pay him. You should, you should never pay him. No, 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 no. He knows, he realizes, he realizes that there's just no chance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, listen, I, I did a little bit of research on these pipes and um, there's a couple of things I want to talk about with them. Uh, there, it's it's not a trivial instrument to play. There's a lot going on there. I think it's deceptive um, how easy you make it look. Am I am I off there? It's not like there's this this there are millions of Illin pipe players, um, um, but it's it looks like it's an instrument with some degree of complexity. No, you're right on the mark. They're they 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 are basically an over evolved bagpipe. They. Um, they were taken to a, a ridiculously complex state through a whole bunch of, of geniuses, really, in the British Isles. And, and they, were, they were truly a, um, a collaborative invention 
Also, a lot of people don't realize that they evolved from a, an instrument called the pastoral pipes, which, ter- uh, which first cropped up in the south of England in the, I think, the late 17th century. Um, but the, the Ilum pipes as they are now are relatively modern. The, the set that I play is uh, first starting to be um, used in concert halls and, and et cetera at the turn of the century, around about 1904. They became the Illin pipes. Before that, they were known as the Union pipes. Yeah. And uh, there's speculation as to why they were called the Union pipes. Uh, it's all very cloudy and cloudy in, in the distant uh, past. But the, um, they're relatively new, but they sound ancient. Yeah. It's because of the, because of the, the nature of them. And they're, 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 it's a double read. So they're related to, they're closely related to oboes and all going further back to the Duduk and, the, and Indian instruments. But um, they, they, they did over evolve and they got stupidly um, complicated at the turn of the century. And they shouldn't have, but these, these old guys who invented the instrument kept pushing it and pushing it. And now it's just a monster of a uh-huh. thing. It's a, it's a nightmare. I mean, when I, when I, when I started to learn, you would not want to be anywhere near the house when I was starting to learn how to play them. I mean, people think that kids learning the violin's bad. You should have heard, you should have heard me trying to learn the pipes. Uh, but my mum and dad, they, they, they had the patience of angels and they put up with it. Um, but no, they're a beautiful instrument. They're, they're, they hit me instantly when the, f- the first time I heard them because as a kid, I just couldn't imagine what was making that sound. And I really did think it was some kind of animal that was well, singing to me. It's, um, it's, it strikes me that as I listened more, more I guess, more in, um, with more concentration, uh, it has this, this capacity for uh, when p- played sort of up-tempo and lively to just evoke a sort of gladness, um, at least to my mind. But, but when played more slowly, there's oh, a yeah. there's a linger in in that that um, I can't I can't remember hearing in another instrument. Uh, I completely agree, and that that was what what brought me to the pipes was the the um, the elegiac sound of them. You know that lament sound that the you play lament on the one pipes and it's 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 like nothing. It's like nothing. It's so expressive. Yeah. Again, that all depends on how you play them and, and your approach. Yeah. But um, yeah, they are. They're they're beautifully lyrical uh, and evocative sound, and they do sound ancient. They do sound ancient. But as I said, they're they're not really. I mean, not nineteenth uh, century. And just to go one click deeper, and and you can expound on this a little bit. But you've got you've got the drone that goes on, um, much as you would in in like Scottish bagpipes. But then you've got what I believe is called the chanter to to do the main melody and then you've That's got right. another thing called a regulator that is doing a kind of chord oh god help us yeah the the regulators <laughs> the regulators uh, again uh, just a, a torture to- yeah. a torture thing i mean to get the, the you've got seven reeds basically that you've got to keep in tune and the seven reeds is, are extremely sensitive to temperature changes uh. now um when I'm playing in Nightwish, for instance, we, I don't use the regulators or the um, or the drones because we've got a vast wall of sound. You know, we don't we don't need them. Yeah. They're, the regulators and the drones are basically for uh, solo playing when you're playing the pipes on their own. Uh, it 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 forms a beautiful backdrop to the chanter, the yeah. beautiful thin reedy sound of the chanter against those drones. And the regulators is a, is just a, a mystical sound. It's it's I love it, but um, yeah, they 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 fit into into rock bands. I, I always I always wanted to take the pipes out of the tradition and into into um, bands band situations. Yeah. Um, with an instrument like the Ilum pipes, there's a lot of uh, nerds around. There's a lot of traditional music nerds who see um, taking them into bands like uh, like Nightwish or any of my earlier bands as sacrilegious. Yeah. 
And the uh, the Illum Pipen Society put a fat bar on me for about five years. Uh, once it, it, it was it was like when Bob Dylan plugged in, you know, it was like, oh my God, Donnelly's gone electric, and it was um, <laughs> it was bad. That was bad. I was I was threatened. I had to I had to go in hiding. I needed police surveillance and the lot. Yeah, witness <laughs> but, protection. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I needed. But it's but but taking them into um, outside of the, the tradition has exposed so many people to their beauty, you know, to their deep, deep um, expression that really hits people, no matter whether they're from Costa Rica or Sydney or Bombay or yeah. or, or where you are now, which I believe is Seattle, is it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the same same thing. But it's interesting though that that you got the pr- the pronunciation right as well, Ilan, because it's spelled U I W L E A W N U I L I A N, which is what a lot of people say. But I was in um, uh, Chicago about twenty years ago, maybe longer, and we'd just done a show. I was in a progressive. I was in a progressive rock band, and uh, we'd just done a, a show, and. Our sound engineer went down to the bar to get some drinks and he overheard these two guys. This is, this is a killer, this. There's a, a couple of guys stood at the bar and one of them turned to the other and he went, oh man, oh man, that band. And he goes, yeah. And he goes, wow. He was going, they've got like keyboards. They've got like electric guitars. They've got like a girl singer. They've got like bass but there's a guy who plays the ovarian pipes, the <laughs> ovarian pipes. <laughs> yeah, so for a while after that, I was known as the, gyne- the gynecologist of progressive rock. Yeah, the ovarian pipes. Oh my gosh. That's yeah, the funniest that's thing I've heard in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there was no way you could beat that with the pronunciation, the ovarian pipes. I've oh my few, gosh, there are so ones. many double entendre <laughs> jokes to be made uh. <laughs> yeah yeah the gynecologist of progressive folk, folk metal <laughs> you, you should totally have that as your tagline on your website <laughs> oh. yeah maybe i should maybe um, i should there was, a, there was a similar one it was nowhere near as good but a guy in a local newspaper up in cumbria i'd there was a poll for the 10 greatest Cumbrians of all time. And I ended up as number two, you know, over William Wordsworth and Stan Laurel and Beatrix Potter, wow. which I thought was so <laughs> absurd. And they asked me, oh, what do you think? This was a BBC poll. And they said to me, how do you feel about being voted the second greatest Cumbrian of all time? I said, well, I feel like a small shellfish in the presence of a giant blue whale, <laughs> you know, a, 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 a mollusk in the presence of leviathans. Yeah. But they they wanted to talk to me and and, uh, and there was an open line I could hear them and they said who, uh, who who is it and some guy went oh it's some guy called Troy Donnelly and I heard him go oh yeah that's the guy who plays the ukulele and pipes <laughs> so there's another one that's another one for your collection Peter oh my goodness <laughs> that's so funny I, well I'm really glad that I I tried to look it up and get it right I actually found. It's, it seems like there's a part of the name that isn't usually used that refers to the fact that you use the elbow to drive the air. That's right. The illin is uh, it's Gaelic for elbow, so they are the elbow pipes. Yeah. But um, as I said, the, the the name that name actually only appeared about 1904. I think before then they were known as the Union pipes, and they were originally uh, they they got to the state that they're in now in the late 18th century, the 17. 80s 1790s i think that's when the first regulators were added to them uh, again this was a combined effort between uh, the north of england scotland and ireland so the regulators were formed i think over in the northeast around newcastle way yeah the drones i think were developed up in scotland and the the chanter was developed in ireland so there, there were they were a, a collective effort as i said of of mechanical geniuses really yeah it's um i mean we're going to get to the music but it's a fascinating backstory uh one of the things i read about the instrument is it first appeared with that name um at least what i read uh, there was a an, a historian an irish historian by the name of Grattan flood who was also a composer that's right Grattan flood yeah he he used uh he used the term and it i guess it stuck um that's right that's right. And a lot of a lot of old timers at the time, because Grattan Flood 
though he was a historian, he, he was uh, very at the fore of Irish nationalism. So he came across the idea that Ireland needed a national bagpipe because he didn't have one at the time. Mm. Uh, England and Scotland did have bagpipes, but Ireland didn't. So they, Grattan Flood, hijacked the Union pipes for uh, political reasons. This is apparently how it went. Yeah. So he decided we will use the Union pipes as um, a national bagpipe for Ireland. And he tried to justify it by quoting uh, Shakespeare. He tried to give it some provenance through Shakespeare, I think in Merchant of Venice, where Shakespeare describes the playing of woolen pipes. And Grattan Flood jumped on that and said, this is evidence of, of bagpipes being around the British Isles earlier, and particularly in Ireland. Uh -huh. But what Shakespeare was actually talking about was that in those days, bagpipes, they used to just hollow out the sheep and stick, st stick the, the chanter into the sheep's mouth, basically. So it was, the pipes were actually woolen because they had wool on them. Oh, wow. Grattan Flood erroneously grabbed that and um, uh, they ended up being called the Gillen Pipes. But a lot of old timers, a lot of um, famous pipe makers at the time refused to call them Gillen Pipes. They continued calling them Union Pipes, but eventually it, it became the Gillen Pipes. But I think Gillen sounds better anyway. It does. It has more, yeah. it's a more musical sounding name. Definitely. Definitely. Um, well, you are definitely the, um, a high practitioner here. Uh, it seems as though when, when someone wants that instrument or that sound, you get a call. Um, <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and Which we'll has go, been nice. In, yeah. It's been nice in the past. Well, and we're going to talk about some of those a um, little bit more detailed, but before as, as maybe as a way of transition, there's this quote I, I have to I have to make sure is properly attributed to you. When, as a teenager, you wanted to travel the world as a musician, uh, but you but you hated empty pop created by cynical twerps. <laughs> <laughs> did I say that? Uh, uh, yeah, you're probably. quoted as saying it, and uh, you know, <laughs> I probably what, did. I probably what can did. you believe? But I, uh, you know, and I'm not, um, I'm kind of of the same mind. I, I have this conversation with my own kids, um, with some of the music I hear them listening to. And um, it's just the, the sort of what I consider the, the, the mundane nature of it and the sort of um, the shallowness of the lyrical content. Uh, it, you know, it kind, of, it kind of drives me to madness. And it feels like the sort of same feeling that you're, you were describing, if this is a real quote. Um, but it, but. The, the reason I bring it up maybe is because you is you you had this sounds like this gravitation to instruments that had a certain profundity to them. Um, you know, it, yes, you I, mean, I know you play guitar too, but you weren't just um, picking up a synthesizer to make the next sort of you know pop tune. Absolutely, absolutely, and I was always drawn drawn to. Uh, that's where that quote obviously comes from because um, I started to become attached to the idea that music can be deeper, that there, there are deeper meanings to music yeah. and deeper meanings to being a musician. I started to really feel this, this quite strongly that as a kid, that I didn't want to go down uh, the road of um, being a professional musician as such. I just felt a, a terrible need, a beautiful need, I should say, of, to express myself with music. And, um, and as I said, you know, I'd, I'd, hear, I'd hear an instrument and I'd go, I, I, I need to get access to that. I, I don't know what it is, but I need that to be part of my palette mm. as, a, as, a, as a, a composer and as a, a musician. So I, I was always attracted to left of field um, music not that I, I love a lot of mainstream music don't get me wrong sure. but I was always attracted personally for for music that challenged me or made me feel like not that I wanted to escape from anything in music I wanted to go deeper into myself through music you know, a lot of people you use music for um uh, for escape you know to escape the their everyday struggles and you know <laughs> struggles and strife and the pandemic oh yeah there's a pandemic on isn't it? i heard about that yeah there is don't know much about it i live in <laughs> north yorkshire we, we we don't hear about this kind of thing until 
five or six years later. So Tell, the telegram <laughs> hasn't arrived yet. <laughs> no, no, it comes by, by a raven, a raven <laughs> with a, a scroll clutched in its claws. <laughs> but no, getting back to that, Peter, it's a splendid point because it's really important. I, I was never, um, I never sent myself down any one path. Yeah. And I've had such a Catholic um, uh, interest in music, again, instilled in me, fired in me by, by my family, by my dad especially, that um, anything goes for me, anything went for me. So when people would react badly to me playing the Ellen Pipes in, a, in a, a furious rock band, it didn't affect me at all. I just thought this is, it's just an extra voice. So I would jump between, as I do now in Nightwish, I'll jump between um, Illin Pipes to electric guitar or bazooki or low whistles or yeah. uh, singing or whatever. What, whatever needs to be done, I'll do it. And I was going to, I was actually going to bring those, th those very two up. Uh, they're good examples of left of field um, instruments, but that have such a, a beautiful and distinctive sound. Um, yeah. Um, which is why I think I'm, I, I increasingly, as I started to discover more of you, your music, I, it was such a pleasure. Um, you, you, so let's, let's transition then and talk about some of your solo work um, and consistent with this uh, twerp. Um, quote. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you uh you're and we'll work backwards but your most recent solo record and you can keep me honest is the madness of crowds yes and that um that i don't know if you just drew that from sort of how that phrase has entered sort of popular consciousness but it's it's drawn from a title uh by a scottish journalist book and at the very at the core of that book he's sort of decrying the the snake oil salesmen who are sort of selling you know illusory you know um you know dreams and stuff uh and i don't know if this was was part of what informed the 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 music there or if you just like the title can you share some insight there yeah it did it did inform to a degree i mean it certainly inspired me uh, <clears throat> that book uh, as old as it is and and again, well done, Peter. That's you saucy thing. I mean, your your <laughs> research is second to none. <laughs> but um, as you as you will probably know, that book, um, it, the madness of crowds, is actually a subtitle. It's it's called Extraordinary Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. I think I might be paraphrasing. It Extraordinary there, popular delusions. Extraordinary popular delusions. Yeah, the thank you. It's a great um, a great title. It is, it is, it is. And it's an inspiring book. And I've been interested in this subject um, for as long as I can remember. I've, I've been interested in um, uh, philosophy and religion, especially especially the um, the big three. The big three, not Metallica yeah. and Slayer and <laughs> <laughs> the big three religions. <laughs> but I've always been interested in, in this stuff. Uh, Madness of Crowds itself, uh, the album did have uh, references to it, but it, it also goes it it goes much wider. I, I always try to um, to hang uh, to to hang concepts onto things, but give myself much more latitude with it. Um, and the madness of crowds, incidentally, the madness of crowds has got my old pal Thomas from Nightwish uh, reciting on it. Oh wow! Yeah, I actually, yeah, I, I gave him nineteen bottles of wine to get the courage up. To, <laughs> to do it and uh, he me, me and Thomas are big Walt Whitman fans well we're big poetry fans and uh, it was one of our meeting points when we met all those years ago that we were both fans because we, we thought we were fairly um, alone in it so uh, I got him to to recite some stuff from uh, from Leaves of Grass on yeah. one of the, the there's a there's a song on there called um, Now Voyager which again is an, a, a, an allusion to Uncle Walt. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So uh, and also it it's uh, but you know this Peter with my earlier work as well. The, 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 it sounds like I'm a bit of a Walt Whitman nerd now because the the first album I did, The Unseen Stream, back in '96, uh, The Unseen Stream was inspired by Walt Whitman as well. Um, but those albums, uh, they they certainly 
highlight my attitude to music as well. Yeah. My need to use voices. Uh, another voice that I consider just as important as the Ullen Pipes and the um, electric guitar or the low whistle again, which is a very, very strong voice for me, is the string quartet. I love to use the string quartet as a voice yeah. for myself. So there's a lot of a lot of string quartet music in in my solo work because I, I see that as a voice for, yeah. for myself. You're a um, I think you're an under known. Uh, that's a bad phrasing, but um, a composer. Um, I don't think you're known as much for that. So I'm this my encouragement part of my encouragement with this conversation for folks who hear this now and later is to go and uh, I did not get all of it, but I went through a bunch of your solo work and the, the compositions, which is of kind of a classical nature. Um, and it's gorgeous. Uh, the, um, I listened to um, your rendition of Finlandia. Um, I listened to, uh, on this, uh, this is off the unseen stream, uh, to tunnels, to sites. Um, the music's beautiful and, it, um, and unpredictable. Um, you know, there's some of these are, are sort of re-renderings of songs we've heard, but but um, the the comment you made on your website, which by the way you need to update. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. You're right. Um, I really do. It's pathetic, isn't it? Well, I mean, for yeah. there's I mean, so many people interested in you and your music. Like, uh, yeah, a little bit of refresh would would go a long way. Yeah, my, my, my splendid mate, Tim, who set that up for me, he's been on at me for years. He, he's always going, what do you play? And, and I, I keep going, yeah, I'll do it, I'll do it. I'll, I'll, I promise, Peter, I'll do it. I'll do it. Okay, okay, I'll hold you to it. Somehow, okay, somehow okay, there, there needs to be a penalty. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right, you know, you know the, the thing is, with, with, it's an easy enough presumption to make for people, and I, and I understand it, that people just go, oh, that's that guy who plays the the bagpipes you know but um at the same time it's frustrating uh, because it it's not good to be pigeonholed you know right. not as a musician but especially not as a composer and i see myself as primarily a composer that's that's how i uh, i would describe what i do yeah i use all the tools available to me to express something that i need to um write uh, get out to exercise for myself so yeah you're absolutely spot on with with your um review of of my solo music it it is classically based but it's also rooted heavily in traditional music and um progressive rock all the things that i was born out of yeah. are in it are in that music so um i don't have any problem with um having a completely orchestral piece uh, or or um, a choral piece, and then stick some atmospheric e-board electric guitar on it. You know, it, it, there are no rules there aren't for me. Rules. There yeah, aren't I mean, any, but unfortunately, yeah. a lot of people believe that there are rules that you should stick to. I mean, look at the flack that bands get. You know, if 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 you move even slightly outside of the accepted subjective opinion. The fans, you can you can end up in a terrible, terrible hole. Oh my gosh! That, oh, nothing, you know what that's like. Nothing truer was ever said um, than <laughs> what you just said in in the in the conversation that has to do with music and fandom. It's it's the reason I wanted to do this show is because um, we, there are these stereotypes uh, and and people get pigeonholed. Um, you're an example of this, I think. Uh, People love you for what you do in Nightwish, but my my suspicion is 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 they they don't know the the fullness of who you are as a musician, and we'll talk a little bit about in a moment like how much work you've done as a as a producer, um, but you are a full full blown composer, uh, and this this um, solo work reflects that, and um and I love that that you even even there you don't confine yourself. I I have a favorite. Uh, American group called Mannheim Steamroller and they were they helped pioneer a, a class of music here that was referred to as new age and it was really just it was using pipes in fact it's one of the other groups that I'm very fond of that uses um, you know uh, w wind instruments um, in in creative ways 
and they did they did the preposterous at the time of combining um bass guitar and drums with what sounded like classical and traditional music um but they found they found that there was a bit of an appetite for it and i'm hoping by having this conversation that that more people will will look back at some of the work you've done i don't i'm hoping you're going to you'll do more more solo work in the future but there's a lot of work to be to be listened to now um, but let me just ask that will will there be more solo stuff for you in the future or is you just too busy right now well we'll have to see uh, I, I can't see it at the moment I, because i have a a vehicle um where i can compose and be completely happy and that's Auri, the um the 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 small luxury yacht that me and Thomas and Johanna have yeah. got. Um, it's as you know, we we formed Auri a, a few years ago, and we did one album, and uh, and that went down really well with with people who heard it. So um, yeah, Auri. I, I spent most of the the lockdown writing music for Auri. I've still got another okay. three or four pieces ready for the next Auri album. Our new Auri album comes out in September, but um, I composed music for Auri and it feels fulfilled. You know, I feel fulfilled in there with, with, my, with my lovely friends and uh, we have a wonderful way of working and we understand each other and we all like the same thing. So it's, uh, it's nice not working in so much of a vacuum um, as a composer. Yeah. Uh, because the, the the three solo albums I did was was me frantically scribbling around in a darkened room in my underpants at four in the morning. You know that's <laughs> that's quite a, quite a vision, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say I'm going to that image is going to follow me all day. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry for doing that. Too. But, but that, that's kind of the <laughs> that's kind of the picture you would have of of the frantic composer in isolation is yeah yeah hours was, was, and... it, it, yeah yeah but I, but i enjoy that's not to say i won't do uh, any solo music in the future but at the moment um i'm so happy within within our our lovely auri world yeah. that um uh, i'm i'm just delighted to be composing for that yeah okay well i mean you know it's not a never but uh I, it, you're saying something similar to what i remember uh, Eddie Van Halen saying, he was asked, well, why don't you do solo records? He says, well, solo records are often a, a, your need to express something you can't in a project you're already in. And Van Halen allows me to do all the things I already want to do. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, an, that's a nice analogy. At the same time, you know, when I, when I did the madness of crowds, I thought that I could never do anything as good as that ever again, ever, ever, ever. And then my dad said to me, why don't you just never make an album again? Because you can never do anything as good as that again, which was. Dad's which a wise was, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which was sweet. But there is a lot to it. I can't, I think I, I sort of peaked with the madness of crowds. I think it is uh, one of the best things I've ever, ever done. I'm, I'm in love with the thing. And this is completely objectively. I, I, I've got to the point now in my life where, um, I don't have any self anymore yeah. to, to, I don't have any ego to massage anymore. Yeah. Um, I just, I, I've made contact. I've reconnected to the love of music. I had when I was a kid, I, I've reconnected to my, my purpose as a musician and as a composer. So I'm, I'm really quite stupidly com content <laughs> well, with, with the way things are. When I said that your dad's a wise man, you know, it seemed to me that he was using a bit of reverse psychology. And if oh, I were, he was, he, he was. You're if right. I, You're if right. I were to opine on it, I would say um, what I heard from Madness of Crowds is extraordinary. But um, you also are now, um, that record's what, 11 years? Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. It's a, it's a long time ago. Um, but I've done so much in, in, in between that, so much stuff oh, for between, sure. between that time, between then and now. But I, I still love it, Peter, and, and I'm sure I'm sure that me just saying, "Oh, I'll never do another solo album again," that's just because of who I feel now. I'm, I'm, there is more, a lot more music to come out. I'm sure in, in a solo. That, that's where I was going. Is I, you know, um, how you would approach writing, uh, composing a piece in as a solo. 
is different now. And I would be excited to hear that when the time yeah. permits. And, and Ab- absolutely. Yeah. But it is wonderful at the same time to have access to two close friends who can do anything really. Yeah. Within, within Such this talent. Song. Yeah, you're... yeah, it's it's wonderful. We have we have a a quite extraordinary um, work ethic. Yeah, uh, not as well as working um, uh, process, but an ethic behind what we do. And uh, and again, that's made me feel extremely balanced and content with with my compositions at the moment. Yeah, um, good. Well, I want to be cognizant of time, and there's so much. Um... You've done so much. So let me just read out a couple of things you've done uh, in, in the collaborative sense. Um, it, tons and tons of work in the, in the folk space. Um, some things that sort of leapt out at me, um, Bruce Johnson of the Beach Boys. Um, <laughs> yeah. You, uh, you worked uh, on the Robin Hood rec- record with the Ridley Scott film um, that had Russell Crowe, um, Ironclad, uh, uh, another film, kind of a it was sort of a British medieval sword, sword film, right? Extremely gory. Yeah, I, I don't remember Extremely seeing gory. it. I remember the trailer, but but um, you worked on uh, the DreamWorks animation Penguins in Madagascar. Uh, I referenced <laughs> Ham, Hans Zimmer up front, the Tomorrowland uh, sort of him, which they play, I guess, at the opening close of that Belgian sort of electric dance music festival. Like you get the nod very, very often when someone wants to hear these non-traditional instruments, don't you? Yeah, yeah, I do. And I think I think that's, well, I know what it is. It's because uh, I've never tied myself to any one genre. You know, I, they, I think when people get access to my work, it's through non-traditional channels generally. You know, they'll, they'll hear me through um, progressive rock or, progressive folk or, or, or metal or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, so it's, I think, and also I've always been excited about taking veal and pipes, especially out of, out of their traditional background and putting them into um, music that they're not comfortable in yeah. because the, the, the limitations of the instrument, as much as they're the most developed bagpipe on earth, they're still, um, there are still limitations uh, in what key you can play and, and stuff like that. But I, I've got an extremely advanced set of pipes, but I'll talk to you about that some other time. <laughs> but um, but no, it's 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 wonderful to get get the call. You know, fancy coming down to Abbey Road to play on the new Robin Hood film, and it's like, yeah, well, of course. No, oh no, I'm I'm busy. I'm busy at the moment. I'm washing my hair this afternoon. I, I can't. <laughs> you know, Ridley Scott. Who's that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, not important. <laughs> No, and and also another wonderful thing is I've got to I've got to actually play with people I really really admire, yeah. You know, and um, some of my old heroes from when I was a kid, you know, Steve I've, Hackett. I've got to, Steve Hackett, yeah. yeah, Steve Hackett. I'm doing a, I'm doing some more with Steve in the in the future, um, and of course we did it as a as a trade off. He plays on my music, I play on his. So that that was our deal. Yeah. There's no money, no no vulgarity of money. Uh, we, we did it as a as a swap cumbrian barter system <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely but but also i, I mean I've, I've uh i've ended up in the most bizarre scenes peter you know it, uh you know in opera in in uh, playing with full orchestras and choirs and then playing solo in up in the north of <laughs> up in in norway i did a solo piping set they flew me over to Norway. I've got to tell you this story. How much yeah. time have we got? It's, it's, I'll, I'll stop when you need to go. Uh, okay. I, don't, I don't have an end point. <laughs> well, this is just a quick one, just because I know yeah, let's hear it, it. It, it'll amuse you. Is I was up there, and I, I turned up at the hotel with my pipes. I just had the pipes. And um, this guy comes up and goes, oh, uh, are you um, – Troy, the, you're going to be playing them. I said, yeah, yeah. I said, who do I speak to about the arrangements? And he went, oh, you need to go over there at the hotel bar and talk to him. And there was a guy over there with the, the, the most huge beard I'd ever seen, right? This massive beard. And I said, oh, the guy with the beard? I speak to him. And he went, yeah, you, you've got to go. Over. He's, he's called uh, Mr. Vibe, right? I thought, this is interesting. The man's called Mr. Vibe. So I went over to him 
And I said, hello, uh, this is, I'm Troy. Uh, how are you doing? He went, hello, yes, I am um, uh, Mr. Vibe, but you can call me Odd. He was called Odd Vibe. <laughs> Odd really? Vibe. Oh, yeah. wow. Odd Vibe. Now, I, obviously, I, I fell to my knees in hysterics. And he went, what is it with you, English? You're always laughing at my name. And I went, well, Odd Vibe, it's just such a brilliant name. And then I found out later that he, he was from further south, from a, a little town called Hell. So he was Odd Vibe from Hell. <laughs> <laughs> odd vibe from hell oh. oh and if you're if you're out there odd uh do get in touch i'd love to I'd love to see odd. you again see how things are in hell oh my goodness odd vibe from hell, odd uh, vibe from hell. yeah you can't make anyway, that stuff I, up. I, I, I digress peter i digress <laughs> Carry no, it's on. fine it's fine um a <laughs> couple of more here uh just for for people <clears throat> i think just to, to underscore um how broadly you're respected and and called upon to participate in music. You played with Apocalyptica. You played with Arion, uh, who we've had on the show, and we're gonna have have uh, on the show again here in a couple of weeks. Um, um, you played on his album, The Theory of Everything, um, and uh, of course you played on on Thomas. Uh, his um, music inspired by the life and times of Scrooge. Yeah, the, the oh the, yeah yeah the, the duck we one. He made I, we I, had, we, <laughs> the duck one. <laughs> well, I had I had Thomas on the show, and and um, he made this hysterical comment. He says, "You know, how many people are going to take two years off to write an album about a duck?" <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, the, well, it's like the Beatles with the White Album, you know, the Duck Album. Yeah, or <laughs> Dark Side of the Duck. <laughs> but he, but we had, you know, it, it was wonderful doing the Duck album because me and Thomas had a bit of an adventure with that one because uh, we we went and did some um, location location atmospheric scouting up oh. in um, Rannochmuir up in Scotland. Just the pair of us, we headed up there, stayed a night in Edinburgh, and got it got very messy with their whiskey, and then we headed out right out into the into the deeps, the depths of the wilds of the Highlands. We had a great time, did some atmospheric recordings and things. So, oh wow, man! I, 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 we had big fun with the Duck album. <laughs> wow, that's exciting! I had never heard that story. Um, yeah, yeah, that's really really cool. I'm gonna have to go back and listen and see if I can't pick out some of that. Uh, there's some flat there's some there is there's some atmospheric tree rustling sounds uh you can hear a bit of wind uh wind wind has uh, gone through the trees that is yeah. and uh and you, you can hear it right at the beginning of the album and that was that was us two wandering oh, wow. around on the on the moors up, up in the highlands <laughs> uh, i'm gonna go away from this conversation with so many great visuals of you <laughs> <laughs> i must apologize <laughs> no it's all good uh you know that one will help temper the underwear one um sure. <laughs> you do a you i had a conversation yesterday with tommy Karavik from uh camelot and you ah uh, tommy yeah lovely man yeah uh and he you play uh the tin whistle which i think is also called the low whistle um no they're two different they're things two different yeah they are the, the the tin whistle is is your uh standard penny whistle okay which is a tiny little thing like this uh, and it, it has a very different technique of uh that you, that you approach it with okay uh, and you, you use the finger tips to you to on it whereas this is uh the low whistle this is okay. one low whistle and that you actually use the 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 middles of the fingers on like oh, that which is which is a which is a piping technique really yeah, uh, and you and they're they're very they're very different in um, in their uh, their expression in, in in the way you play them. Well, they are for me. Yeah, I would never use staccato techniques on a low whistle, but I use staccato techniques on a tin whistle. Tin whistles are very bird like instrument, and the low whistles are very more uh, a much more um, aquatic sound to me. Yeah, well, but so the the tin whistle you played on uh, under gray skies. Which is on the Haven record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I have to tell you, that's a you set the tone with that. Um, and he talked to me yesterday a little bit about how some of that came about melodically, but um, it, it's haunting. And uh, it, you know that song really struck me, uh, and I was so delighted to find this this um, connection that you played that. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. 
Um, and I really, I really enjoyed doing it as well. Uh, uh, again, I love to take the instruments into, into every possible corner of music. Yeah. And uh, Camelot, I, I mean, I knew the Camelot guys because we did a tour, a, a, an American tour together. And, um, and uh, Thomas just yeah, called, called me and said, well, will you come and play some whistle on this? You know, it'd be fabulous to get it on. So I, I did, and, and they were all delighted with it and loved it. And, um, and he sent me a lovely case of my favorite wine. <laughs> There's another theme uh, coming from this conversation that includes alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> In moderation. In moderation. Um, he lies. I have to ask, um, it's sticking with me now. You, you, just, you just told us that the, the piping technique using sort of the middle pads, why would you not use the fingertips? Um, it's to do with the the positioning of the holes on the on the chanter, okay. and it's um, it's a lot. It's hard. To, I'll, I'll have to show you next time I see okay. you how how that actually works. But the 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 stretch between the holes is um, is quite wide, wide, especially on the bottom bottom right hand. The fingering of the the Ilan pipes is is insane. You know, and it changes as you move up the octave as well, which is really, really not good, but perfectly beautiful. <laughs> but um, if you're a beginner, it's 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 just like, oh my god, what have I done? What have I done? Yeah. Well, I, uh, yeah. Next time I get to see you in person, I need you to show me, because um, the more I hear about it, it that um, it it must be part of the reason that there aren't nearly as many Ilan Plight players there as there are guitar players. <laughs> <laughs> yeah definitely but they are notoriously difficult things to play but you but as with all instruments if you if you are committed and you're devoted to the to the thing you, you just you just do it you, sure. you just put in the time and you you get to the point where you get what you need from the instrument yeah. and that luckily for me is is what i've actually achieved yeah the, in spades um it, you know you, you, what you do and uh, the instruments you play and not and we'll get to some of the vocal work that you actually do as well uh i think lends so much to uh, to nightwish um which i'm a fan of and and have been for a long time but before we get quite there I, there's so much work you've done with um recording artists in the folk era uh, uh, area um I, i'm i'm going to call out a few uh, iona i I'm hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly working yep. with Barbara Dickinson and Maddie Pryor. And you've done just tons of records. I mean, I think like 18 records, if I'm counting right, between these artists. And you transition from not only just participating with the music, but producing, yeah? Absolutely, yeah. Especially with Maddie Pryor and, and Barbara, who were, who were iconic figures in British British music, yeah. um, in especially British British folk music. Um, yeah, we, with them again. This is, I think, this is a reason why I didn't get to make as many solo albums as I should have, um, is because I give so much of my compositional time, as well as production time, to to those albums that I did with with Maddie and with Barbara. I think I've done about six with Barbara, and I think about five with Maddie, and a lot of the music uh, was uh, arranged by me. Yeah. Or some of it composed by me as well. So um, again, I, it's constantly working uh, deeply in in um, in musical expression, not just production, but but yeah, production wise, um, it's something that I just fell into through arrange uh, through my love of arranging and and composition, and having a clear a clear uh, vision as to how I wanted things to sound, which is what production really is, which That's is right. what all production is it's having a having a clear focus and vision on it and um uh, well with barbara um she's <laughs> she's been wonderful you know like the suggestion of um there's an old song called um lord franklin's lament lady franklin's lament it's a beautiful song beautiful song you can probably find it on youtube or whatever and um we we were doing a version of that on an album and it came to me one night when I was in my underpants downstairs again, uh, scribbling stuff out again, <laughs> just to remind you. 
<laughs> you're gonna get these terrible ideas that I wander around in my underpants all the time, and I don't. But um, yeah, I had this, I had this grand idea of getting the Scola Cantorum, the famous boys' choir of Ample Fourth Abbey, on the on the song. And she went, "Well, absolutely, yeah, let's do it. That sounds great." So I've always had this uh, wonderful um, communication with with my friends who I've worked with, in that we we tend to think alike. In yeah. musical terms, so I never, I've never felt like a, a hired gun or a, a hired hand. It's always felt like I've been deeply integrated into uh, whatever music's going on. I always feel like it's part of me. So, so then you find yourself uh, conducting a boys' choir, uh, and the technology's all collapsed, and you're having to revert to a metronome, oh, a, wow. a mechanical metronome that you borrowed off the off the the teacher of music, oh, wow. and that's really that really puts you on the spot that kind of thing but i love that i, I love that kind of, i thrive on it i love it yeah I, um the the thing that um that just I, I why i wanted to have to have this part of the discussion is it, it's another we talked about your you, you as a composer we talked about some of the other kinds of music you made and certainly the the instruments um but but you and you said it really well having being someone who can have a vision for a record and produce it and drive towards that another skill set and I, I don't think it's something people know about you uh as much so i wanted to i wanted to highlight it and it's not that you've only just done this as a one-off you've done it multiple times um um and i so i and i think it's remarkable um so it's part of me wanting to dimensionalize you for for people who well less well aware of that. thank well thanks for picking up on that Peter because it it is a, it is part of my my vast uh, canvas of love of music that all of that stuff and production is really important and it's vital if it's vital that uh, as musicians we 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 try to be as 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 full of clarity yeah. as we possibly can that's and, a good way to say it and stick to our, our, our path, you know, as, as, as much as we can. There's lots of distractions out there in the world and uh, to, stay, to stay clear is, is not easy, but it's massively um, fulfilling and satisfying. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, uh, boy, we could spend an hour just on that. You're exactly right. Good. Um, so I, what I did want to at least briefly mention The Bad Shepherds, I listened to a bunch of music um, from the Bad Shepherds, and that was so much fun. Uh, how did yeah, well, you've, you've, you've nailed it there. That was what that was the that was our brief was to just have as much fun as we possibly could. Yeah, not take it at all serious, and it was just me and my friend having having laugh, a laugh. But it went ballistic over here. Yeah. It, you, the, towards the end of our time, we almost came out to the states. You you would have seen us, but over here we 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 stormed Glastonbury Festival and all kinds of things and and it was just a joke to us it was just a bit of fun but a, a very serious joke um, sure. uh, joke's the wrong joke's the wrong word it was we took it really seriously but it, our brief was to have as much fun as possible yeah and that's uh, I, uh that that um sensibility comes out when you hear the music and when you watch because there's youtube videos where when you watch you guys play is not that you're not serious about the song or, or serious about how you perform the song, but the song has a certain, um, the, the music because of the songs you're covering and how you're covering them have a certain uh, whimsy or gladness to them that um, other kinds of music don't have. And not that all music should, but it's nice to have music that does that. You know what I mean? Right. Right. Absolutely. And it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful uh, counterpoint yeah. Uh, to the to the deadly serious music that I'm, I'm committed to, yeah, and uh, and you know, I, uh, myself, I'm, I'm I'm not I'm not a blithe spirit at all. I, I, people could see me as as blithely kind of floating through things, but but I'm not. I, I I'm very serious about music, but at the same time, I love to have as much fun as I possibly can. Sure. With Those music, two with, 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 yeah, the two, and the two the two run perfectly well together. Yeah, so they're not mutually it, it was, exclusive at all. Yeah, and and the amount of stuff you know, you mentioned some of the the sessions I've done in the past. I've never done anything that I didn't want to do, uh, I'm ne and I've never ever done anything for the money either. Even when I was at my poorest, um, I was never. It was never like, oh, oh, okay, I'll I'll go and do that. How much am I going to get for that? I, I I was only interested in doing things that I thought would 
would entertain me and give me something yeah. th- other than money, give me a, a new experience that would that I, I could use in my memoirs when I reach the age of 89, which is next year. <laughs> so um, <laughs> You were very so, specific with that number, 89. <laughs> So uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I used to busk when I was a kid. I used to I used to busk in the in London Underground when I, I moved uh, I moved south from the north, and uh, I've always um, I've always just been deeply uh, infatuated with musical experiences, different uh, different different musical experiences. I've always tried to seek them out, and that's why. Uh, to find Nightwish when I did in 2007 was just such a beautiful revelation for me. Yeah. You know, to take to take take my instruments, which originally you were probably going to move on to this, Peter. But um, my original move into Nightwish was strictly as a as a session player. Yeah. Uh, and of course, at the time, the the, the guys didn't know that. I played other instruments. They just thought I was a, a guy who played this very unusual set of pipes. Um, but again, when I was asked to do that, it was the same as when I was asked when I was a kid to go and play in something. It was like, wow, yeah, I want to do that. Oh, yeah, that sounds fantastic. Symphonic metal. That's that's for me. Yeah, that is for me. So um, there was there was no there was no, never a question of it of. Um, been involved in that and then of course things got completely out of control and before yeah. you knew it here i am <laughs> here you are just about to go yeah here we are into um te- well how long have i been there now well i've had 14 years of of, of uh, involvement in nightwish how did and that original call uh come to do the session that was Pip Williams, the orchestral arranger for the band, and he's still our orchestral arranger. Okay. He um, knew that he knew I would love it. He just yeah. knew I would love it. Uh, he, he very rarely sends me anything, but this time he said, "You've got to hear this," and he sent me the album once, which he just orchestrated. And I heard that, and I thought, "This isn't what, at all what I thought." You know, he, he told me he'd been working with a metal band. And this was like no metal I'd ever heard, you know. It was, uh, yeah. Uh, and I, ever since though, I mean, I've had a fabulous crash course in metal. <laughs> you know, I, I know everything now. I mean, I can tip tiptoe around a dance floor to Cannibal Corpse. Um, <laughs> There's to, another uh, image that <laughs> <laughs> the, Don- <laughs> the Donnelly Chronicles here. <laughs> 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 well you've got to write it uh, yeah you've i'm gonna to have write to write it. this up but yeah the the um uh it's expanded my my musical worldview and i've realized things about the metal community rare things rare and beautiful things about the metal community that i'm now a massive part of because i love it i love i love i love the whole metal scene um revelations you know to me about the future of live music and about the future of recorded music when people talk about the death of of rock and roll and the death of the music scene the end of recorded music and cds and uh it's all nonsense it'll continue as long as there's a metal scene (laughs) yeah Uh, i uh 100 agree with that i um i had an anthropologist on the show a month or so ago from london and she her entire phd um, sort of dissertation and some of her other published papers deal with the metal community. Um, wow. Talk about I'd how... I'd like to read that. I'll, I'll send you a pointer. She um, she continues Excellent. to publish, but things like the attendance at the uh, at metal shows is part of the way that people in the metal community create credibility and community, uh, which is why the absence of live shows is is particularly hard for the metal community because it's it's social yeah. in a way that for other genres it's it's not quite the same um, yeah and there's other published studies that show that um you know metal music listeners are more faithful to their companions they're, they have better work-life adjustment and on and on um which doesn't make it better it's just an interesting set of data points um when you think about this community and um so I, i'm a fan of it it's one of the reasons i do this show and i you know i was gonna, but going back to nightwish um you know the way that 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 
Tuomas does the the lion's share of the composing, yeah. For the he does absolutely almost all of it, yeah. But the way that he writes, um, there's, and I talk about this a lot because I, I'm a I'm a fiction writer in the other side of my life. Uh, is there's there's so much narrative movement in so much of his music, and um, whether it's a whole concept album or just sort of encapsulated in a particular song, and the the um, both the the instruments that you have become expert at, as well as now me having gone back and listened to your own compositions with your solo work and others, it families so well with that music. It was a match made in heaven. Like the the you coming to that group with the set of instruments that you can play and the way you know the way you play them, I mean, it was destined to be as magical as it has become. I guess. Is, is my well, that's, that's that's such a lovely thing to say. It really is, and um, I'm absolutely delighted and flattered that you 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 think like that. And hopefully, um, I mean, I do get I do get wonderful, lovely messages from from uh, the fans, and again, the loyalty of the loyalty of the metal scene is is just wonderful. You know, yeah. when you when you when you compare it to other other genres, uh, it's so open. It's so open minded. The metal yeah. scene it's really and, it, uh, i love it. It, it there's an inclusive it, you know i've been to some of the, me the metal festivals particularly in europe and uh fans love to fly their colors of the bands they love but they um but they share this there's this sort of common something they share in common that's really quite beautiful um, yeah and as as strong as anywhere in inside the the nightwish fandom um and we don't uh, you know we're out of time i can't go into everything with Nightwish, but I wanted just to ask you a couple of things. So it looks to me as though increasingly from, you know, when you became involved with the band as a session player to becoming a full member um, that you've played on uh, in the, in the music, you played not only more instruments, but you've been more involved vocally so much so that in, on the last record, there's an, there's a song where you sing the lead, which is the harvest song, correct? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I, I was, <laughs> I was press ganged into that. <laughs> it was like it was like being it was like being uh, Shanghai onto a ship. You know, I was bopped over the head with a bottle, and when, when I woke up, I'd done the whole vocal. You know. Oh, I don't uh, know, man. It sounds good to me. Uh, it, uh... No, I, I, it, it's it's lovely because we found on the last tour, we discovered to our delight that the three voices. Um, uh, in harmony uh, of Marco and Flo and myself created a lovely, lovely tone, all of its own, yeah. a, a very lovely sound. And we wanted to continue with that, really. We wanted to expand on that with uh, the Human Nature album. So there's a lot of three-part harmonies on that album. and all, But also um, the, the band were massively encouraging me to, to sing more because uh, I... I I'm I'm kind of reluctant to, well, I'm not reluctant to sing, but when you've got such great singers like Flo yeah. and and Marco, uh, it's like, well, you know, they're 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 so brilliant. But it was pointed out to me that my voice is is a complete opposite to theirs, and uh, works in a different atmosphere. It works a different, uh, it it gives off a different time to yeah. to theirs so i was convinced and and i did it and i was really surprised uh i surprised myself that i actually liked it <laughs> yeah the, the, i you know uh, I, I my suspicion is that um thomas had a sense that what was going to be right for that song for the lead vocal was a certain sound a absolute certain timber a certain you know um, register and it came off beautifully um, yeah, you're right. You're right. It couldn't have. It, it couldn't have. That song couldn't have been sung um, by anybody else but him. I think. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and it, he had to do it. It. Yeah. It needed to be. Um, you know, the the subject matter. Even it needed to feel uh, kind of like yeah. coming up from the earth, right? Um, yeah. And so you just there. Even just the, the the pitch and tonal choices would have would have it would have been hard for a female voice of any vocalist to capture that. And so it was a really smart choice. And I, I'm hoping that it's indicative of 
uh, us getting to hear more, you know, not to supplant anybody in the band, but I think no. it's just another, uh, it's another, you know, brush that you can paint with, with the music that, that you, your voice is, is unique. Definitely. Well, well, thanks again. We, we do intend to, and we will use the voice more. Um, it worked, it worked a treat on Shoemaker um, as well, uh, as well. I was, I was convinced that there was a place for for my softer voice um, in Nightwish after Human Nature. So yeah, I will certainly be singing more on the next Nightwish album, and and of course in Ari, uh, I get yeah. to sing quite a bit as well. So um, I'm I'm a lot more I'm a lot happier now um, using my voice strictly as an instrument. You know, and using it as a, as a, as a, as you say, another brush for the canvas. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm delighted with it. Yeah, I, I'm. We're delighted with it. Uh, it's exciting. Uh, it's just you know, it it just creates a, a, a broader set of tools that you can create with. Um, not and you know, and there were already so many. Uh, you have this uh, abundant. What do they call it? A, uh, uh, not an abundance of riches. Um, embarrassment of riches. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> is, what, is what you have so it's a great expression a couple of quick questions to close you do magic yeah i do it's 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 been a hobby since i was a kid and uh sleight of hand yeah sleight of hand yeah i saw you do one on the on the internet um that's cool just a just a hobby then huh well uh i was in a i was in a magical society for a while Oh. Uh, but the, but it, it's for it was really for professional magicians, and I'm not interested in that. Yeah, my interest in magic was to um, uh, basically not just entertain people, but remind people of something that's been lost. Uh, remind people of the thing that they lost when they were trundled into school at the age of five, and that wonderful um, uh, those moments of astounded yeah. magic that we experienced as kids so I, I, I there was a bit of a philosophical um approach to it but then again you can't beat um after show magic you know if you've just done a show yeah. and you end up in some kind of bar or uh, the hotel bar and you you end up doing magic it's just it's bliss yeah, you know yeah. to see people's face faces and people running out of the room you know convinced that you're 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 the spawn of satan and you know because you've just vanished a coin i mean i don't know how you get to that from vanishing a coin but, <laughs> but uh yeah it's it's a, a colorful colorful pursuit yeah um and and hobby for for especially in what i do and also i've got lots of times in hotel rooms mm -hmm. so i've got nice mirrors that i can practice in front of i like what you said there a lot because uh some of my favorite books that i i read are usually the the central protagonists are of an age that sort of um 10 8 9 10 11 year old kids who are are old enough to sort of have to face big challenges but young enough still to sort of believe in magic believe yeah they they're, they've not been sort of hardened by the world and have cynicism and doubt is you know and, and that's a beautiful beautiful age and i think that what you what you've said there's right when you sort of stipulate to you know suspend your disbelief and you get to watch magic and can just be awed by you know you know, don't know how they did that um, yeah yeah that, that that's the very reason i love magic is that that sense of wonderment when the, the you know the illusion is completed yeah absolutely and it unlocks something in us yeah and that when you say the illusion is completed when you see the effect this is what is what fascinates me is that you see the effect and for a moment you you reduce to a clear space of a five-year-old until the rational mind goes well he must have put it up his sleeve yeah. or but for a moment we're actually free we're actually free of the cynicism of the world just for a little it, and i also I, I also use it as a uh, analogy to music as well it's very similar it's the same effect yeah. you can move from one chord to another and it can make you go oh my god that's it makes your hairs go up yes and then you go well all he did was he just suspended the fourth that's all he did but it's like a magic trick and yeah. people people are reduced to 
a, a more a more pure state through music, just like a ma- seeing a magic trick. Yeah. So once you make that move of a chord or a, or an or a, or a note on a on a flute or a guitar or a, a voice, once you try to explain it, you're finished. It's yeah. gone. The magic's it's, disappeared. It's right. gone. It's and, ineff- uh, and it's it's what they uh, they call ineffable. It's, it's yeah, it's the ineffable. It right. truly is. And magic and uh, and music closely related in that. I always remember that. hearing hearing um, Elgar's Nimrod var- Nimrod from the Enigma Variations, and this he goes he goes from G to E flat, and I heard it, and he, it it like it, it was like um, blinds being lifted. It was like I was seeing light at that chord change, and I thought it was the most beautiful thing. And then some idiot went, well, that's just gone from a G to an E flat. I was like, no, it isn't. Yeah. That's not what it is at all. You're describing oh, well, all the you mechanics. Did. Yeah, exactly. Like the mechanics are, well, he put it up his sleeve or, you know, he, he palmed it or something. But in the moment, in the moment, we're actually alive and free. And it's, it's, it's wonderful. You're exactly right. I can just as you're talking, I can. Uh, there are a number of songs popping to mind that uh, there were certain chord progressions, certain changes, sorts of turns of turns of phrase. Absolutely, my hair stood up uh, on yeah. my arms, and um, I was transported. You know, and yeah. uh, you know, it, and you feel alive. You feel uh, um, uh, for me anyway. I feel more powerful as a as a absolutely. Human. Peter, you're, you're onto it. You're onto it. Yeah. So this is the difference. We've we've talked about this before. That that um, in the band of me and Thomas talked talked about this years ago. That um, what we're what we're actually up against here is two very different states of of being. Like I don't want to sound pretentious. That sounds pretentious. But there's there's music for for uh, entertainment and dancing around to. Oh, tiptoeing in the in the case of the cannibal, cannibal corpse. corpse yeah <laughs> <laughs> but there's music for entertainment and for out, having fun with uh some of the greatest pop music and greatest rock music ever and i love it all you know there's nothing like dancing around to bon jovi or abba or something like that and or, or having a good drink with your friends but then there's the other side which is music for self-discovery which you experience personally yeah. you can't actually really experience it with other people and this is a whole new it's not it's not new it's old it's very it's very old but that's an area that not many people explore these days because the attention span of people has, has been compromised oh my nowadays gosh. In, in these days and yeah. uh, and standards have, have lowered so much now and um people are losing contact more and more with with what's real and what's important you know, people are losing this, and people are more more concerned with chat rooms, and um, they should go out and uh, into a into a forest and listen to a stone chat. Yeah, the bird, the stone chat. They'll get much more out of it than in chat rooms. And and I'm convinced because I'm a, I'm an optimist. I'm, I'm worse. I'm, I'm worse than that. I'm Panglossian. I'm <laughs> I'm completely in love with with um, uh, with the world. But uh, when I get down to, to dis- on, a, on, a, on a shallow level, I despair about it. I think, oh, no, no, no. Poor kids are not going to experience what we experienced. You know, the, the joy of putting an album on and listening to it on your own in headphones, you know, for, for 40 minutes in your own little world. Kids aren't going to experience this anymore. Yeah. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. You know, with the resurgence of vinyl and I know of friends whose kids are starting to listen to classic old albums and uh who are getting into serious music uh, i'm i'm optimistic about it i think i think we're, gonna, we're hopefully going to get out of it well i love your optimism and i i saw uh, an article just within the past couple of days that said that in all of sort of physical media album sales um metal was led the way um, there we are and- uh, yeah, and it's because you know metal fans. I think they have a certain attachment to uh, the physical product. It's not the transience of digital ownership. Um, That's right. But I, I I lament with you. You know the the attention span. I think a lot of the the ways people communicate now 
um, and this is going to sound like a get off my lawn statement, but with all of the social <laughs> media, it's, it's, it's quick bites. I mean, the, the, the wisdom given to you, if you're going to publish something at Instagram is it better not be longer than 10 seconds and sometimes only five. And I'm like, how is that kid ever going to like write a thoughtfully constructed essay about anything of real merit? Like if they, if they have to go to university or something. Um, uh, and, and so I love, I love your optimism around music where, where fans are, are, and you guys write music that um, I think creates the opportunity to take the journey because so much of it. Um, and I talked to Thomas about this. It, it, it works really well if you listen to it linearly instead of like going to track eight. Definitely. Um, and you know, you, you guys sort of publishing music that has a, that experiential component, I think encourages that kind of listening, which I think is really, I know this is very philosophical, but I think it's healthy. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and uh, I think the, 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 the sooner this sea change happens, the better. And, I, and as I say, I'm, I am optimistic about this. And um, I think that you can see this starting to happen. I think kids, kids nowadays, uh, it's only a matter of time before their humanity overwhelms their addiction to technology. And they decide that they want something more substantial. They, want, they don't want a quick fix of a McDonald's burger. They want a, some serious cuisine. They want something cooked by real people. And they yeah. want to enjoy it with other people as well. They don't want to be isolated in their bedrooms. It's like my dad. My dad, came, my dad said a classic, right? He said to me, he was going, well, he's got a really strong accent. My accent is quite Queen's English compared to him. Okay. No, no, I've got, <laughs> I have got a strong Northern accent, but, but my dad's accent is really strong. And he said to me, you might need subtitles for this. <laughs> but he went, oh, I said, no, no. I said, no, the thing is, the thing is, Troy, is now it's going to get better. Now meaning nothing, right? That's, he said, now it's going to get better in this world until people close their flap tops. Flap tops? You know, laptops. And I went, Dad, it's a laptop. And he went, I don't care what it is. He says, until they close them, there's, nothing's going to happen. And, and yeah, and he had, he had a superb point. That's the wisdom of the ancients. Yeah. He, close he, your flap tops. Yeah, I actually like the term. Uh, flat top. There's something. The, <laughs> there's something uh, onomatopoeic about that. You're um, right. Uh, no, it's you know, it's. Uh, I'm glad we're kind of as we close our conversation, we're closing it with these ideas because um, it's it's consistent with the music that you're making. Really, the music that you've always made. There's been a sort of substance to it. There's been fun too. Uh, um, and and by the way, those two things aren't mutually exclusive, as as we've said. Um, yeah. But the 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 experience that um, you, the, your, your dedication to music that has substance, because there's a really, really great quote on your um, outdated website <laughs> where you say, uh, let me get it so that I, I quote it correctly. You say, um, uh, in the quest to make the most emotional and uncommercially driven music possible, <laughs> 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 which I just love. Uh, and I understand uh, it's not that you don't want to have success with your music because certainly part of the point is you want people to hear it and participate in it. But the, I understand the substance of that comment, which is, you know, in America, uh, and I, this is something I mentioned to Tommy yesterday, um, when you talk about sort of um, attention span, so much of our music is rooted on, um, you know, four bars and and the blues and there's and that's great music. But what what did what what's beautiful about listening to Nightwish and and frankly other um, music from outside the country is your musical base is different. So the way you will turn a phrase and the thing I was saying to Tommy is he'll have a um, a melodic phrase that always surprises me because it goes longer than I think it should because I'm so used to a certain thing. Yeah, um, and that's true as well with your music and the music that you make with Nightwish. And so I think by almost sort of inherently it um it defies the categorization of of sort of pop music and it 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 asks a little bit more of the listener and so the, my optimism is that you have so many fans that it's encouraging to me that that um you're making this substantive music and it's you've garnered such a following 
That's a wonderful observation and true. I, I, I completely believe that. And I think that what draws people to music that isn't mainstream is again, what uh, the analogy of um, quality of food, you know, quality of whether you want fast food or whether you want haute cuisine, you know, yeah. it's, a, it's a simple analogy, but I think it really does apply to, yeah. to the, the modern approach to um, not only making music and consuming it, but dreaming about what it could be. Yeah. Well, I, I couldn't be happier that you're at it and have been at it for so long. Um, I'm gonna when I when I publish all of this, Troy. Where's the best place for me to to point them to as a gateway into your world? Is it your website still the best spot? The we, uh, well, yeah, the website, um, the website, uh, and I, I do have a, an official Facebook page as well, okay. so uh, people can see what, uh, my daughter runs it, and uh, people can see what's happening on there. Uh, but yeah, for an overview of what I've done and what I do. And and that quote that you just gave me from uh, you know <laughs> the most uncommercial. Don't scrub music that ever. one. I love it. I love it. <laughs> no, that's stay, that's staying on there. <laughs> um, but yeah, people people can can find out about me on there. Okay, we'll we'll point them to those those places. Um, okay. Two last questions. So, what's next for you um, musically? Well, uh, well, know, on go ahead. Sorry, go on, ahead. On Friday, I fly out to Finland uh, because we've got three night wish shows. Uh, next week, so I'm oh, going to be wow. out in Finland. I'm going to be out in Finland for ten days. Um, our new, uh, we've got our second Auri single comes out at the end of next week. Okay. Our first one came out of, about a, a month ago, I think, um, and that's had a fantastic response. We've had a wonderful response to that. So Auri is starting to kick in. I'm doing a lot of interviews for Auri. Um, I'm doing a couple tomorrow morning. I've got one on Friday before I fly out. Uh, the Auri uh, promotion machines really starting to oil up. Good. So we've got some some uh, Auri promo stuff. Me and Thomas over in Finland as well. Uh, then after that, uh, just see what happens with this. Uh, what was it you mentioned? The pandemic or something? So yeah. There's been some people sneezing. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, we'll see what happens with our our tour. <laughs> At the moment, it's looking good. We'll 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 see how things pan out. And uh, yeah, and just music, 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 and more music, and lots of uh, magic and music, and more magic and more music, and as much as we could possibly can have, and uh, and have as much fun as we possibly can while doing it. Yeah. So, very last question: uh, outside music, is there is there some abiding passion you have, a thing that you want to do when time permits? Um. Music is a bit all-consuming, but because music for me is is like a, a valve, uh, it's something I've, the facility that my dad discovered in me when I was a kid is that it's not very difficult for me. I'm really lucky in, in, in that I don't have to struggle too hard with music. Uh, it is like opening a valve for me. So, which is a double-edged sword because I, it, when I close the valve, I, I, t I tend to be a bit lazy. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, can, I can be lazy if I, if I turn it off, but... Um, it's turned off at the moment for a little while. I do turn it on every now and again and dabble, but um, I'll tell you what, I've just bought a metal detector. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I bought a metal detector, and I'm, I'm a bit excited about using this. I went into our front garden the other day, and I found a Victorian penny from 1900. Really? With Queen Victoria's head on it and everything. Wow. And this, yeah, it was, it was mind-blowing. And this friend of mine, who's been metal detecting for years, he was really, really depressed and, and really annoyed that I found this because he hasn't found anything <laughs> as good as that in years. <laughs> and it was, my, it was my maiden voyage. Oh, my so, gosh. Yeah, I know. I know. You so have the same facility with metal yeah. detecting as you do with music. <laughs> <laughs> no. Just a lucky scarce that I am. Yeah, so I'm getting into metal detecting, so I'm, I'm going to be approaching the local farmer to see if I can... I can trudge around in his field, see if I can find. And sure enough, my dad said to me, there's no doubt that I will find Excalibur. <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, but that would be something. You know, well, it's, uh, the, moment, the moment I find it, I'll call you. you yeah, I'll come up. We'll take pictures. We'll do an Excalibur <laughs> selfie. Uh, you know, there's something interesting there, though. The, the, the yearn to sort of 
discover something um you know there's a little bit for me anyway there's a little bit of that in music uh of course yeah you know the yeah. the unearthing the thing that exists um but bringing it to the light of day yeah yeah there's so many wonderful invisible connections aren't there you know it's, really it's, it's the, you know it, it is the the whole world and um i think I think all of them bleed into each other, really. They all bleed into each other. Anything that is as, as, as full of delight as music and, and literature and uh, the, all of the arts yeah. bleed into something like metal detecting. Uh, and, I, and, and that's a good way. What you just said there is, it didn't occur to me, but it does now. I can, I can see that that's actually part of it. Yeah. Metal yeah. detecting and music. I'll have to give that some thought. Yeah, metal detecting and metal music. That's, yeah, metal detecting that, that's and metal your, there, music. There's your memoir title. Well, can you imagine what it's going to be like when we play at, at the Vacan Metal Festival and I've got my metal detector? It's going to oh, go crazy. It's oh going to explode. It'll just burst into flames. There's so much metal. You should, you should bring that out on stage with you. <laughs> <laughs> What's Donnickly playing just, now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What on earth is he playing now? Good God, it's a metal detector. The guy can play yeah. anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Oh. Well, that's a well, you've been generous with your time. Um, I appreciate you spending some time with me this morning. Oh, listen, it's been wonderful, Peter. I've enjoyed every second of it. It's it's a breath of fresh air. Well, let me uh, play the outro real quick and then um, hold on for just one more second. I'll say my goodbye. Um, but okay. we will point people to your uh, these various sites. Everybody, I really encourage you to, to do a deep dive on on all that Troy's done. There's so much really good music. And I've tried to give a, a bit of an overview here to, today. Um, but it's, uh, it, it was a delight to get to know him better by spending some time here. So, again, thank you, Troy. Thanks very much.